The 9-11 Commission Report, Chapter 6.4 Change and Continuity On November 7, 2000, American voters went to the polls in what turned out to be one of the closest presidential contests in U.S. history, an election campaign during which there was a notable absence of serious discussion of the al-Qaeda threat or terrorism. Election night became a 36-day legal fight. Until the Supreme Court's 5-4 to four ruling on December 12th and Vice President Al Gore's concession, no one knew whether Gore or his Republican opponent, Texas Governor George W. Bush, would become president in 2001. The dispute over the election and the 36-day delay cut in half the normal transition period. Given that a presidential election in the United States brings wholesale change in personnel, this loss of time hampered the new administration in identifying, recruiting, clearing, and obtaining Senate confirmation of key appointees. From the old to the new. The principal figures on Bush's White House staff would be National Security Adviser Condoleezza Rice, who had been a member of the NSC staff in the administration of George H. W. Bush, Rice's deputy, Stephen Hatley, who had been an assistant secretary of defense under the first Bush, and chief of staff Andrew Card, who had served that same administration as deputy chief of staff, then secretary of transportation. For secretary of state, Bush chose General Colin Powell, who had been national security adviser for President Ronald Reagan, and then chairman of the joint chiefs of staff. For secretary of defense, he selected Donald Rumsfeld, a former member of Congress, White House Chief of Staff, and, under President Gerald Ford, already once Secretary of Defense. Bush decided fairly soon to keep Tenet as Director of Central Intelligence. Louis Free, who had statutory tenure tenure, would remain Director of the FBI until his voluntary retirement in the summer of 2001. Bush and his principal advisers had all received briefings on terrorism, including bin Laden. In early September 2000, Acting Deputy Director of Central Intelligence John McLaughlin led a team to Bush's ranch in Crawford, Texas, and gave him a wide-ranging four-hour review of sensitive information. Ben Bonk, Deputy Chief of the CIA's Counter-Terrorist Center, used one of the four hours to deal with terrorism. To highlight the danger of terrorists obtaining chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapons, Bonk brought along a mock-up suitcase to evoke the way the Om Shinrikyo doomsday cult had spread deadly sarin nerve agent on the Tokyo subway in 1995. Bonk told Bush that Americans would die from terrorism during the next four years. During the long contest after Election Day, the CIA set up an office in Crawford to pass intelligence to Bush and some of his key advisers. Tenet, accompanied by his deputy director for operations, James Pavitt, briefed President-elect Bush at Blair House during the transition. President Bush told us he asked Tenet whether the CIA could kill bin Laden, and Tenet replied that killing bin Laden would have an effect but would not end the threat. President Bush told us Tenet said to him that the CIA had all the authority it needed. Footnote. Pavitt also recalls telling the President-elect that killing bin Laden would not end the threat. Vice President-elect Cheney, Rice, Hatley, and White House Chief of Staff-designate Andrew Card also attended the briefing, which took place about a week before the inauguration. The President noted that Tenet did not say he did not have authority to kill bin Laden. Tenet told us he recalled the meeting with Bush, but not what he said to the president-elect. He told us, however, that if circumstances changed and he needed more authority, he would have come back to either President Clinton or President Bush and asked for the additional authority. End footnote. In December, Bush met with Clinton for a two-hour, one-on-one discussion of national security and foreign policy challenges. Clinton recalled saying to Bush, I think you'll find that by far your biggest threat is bin Laden and the Al-Qaeda. Clinton told us that he also said, One of the great regrets of my presidency is that I didn't get him, bin Laden, for you, because I tried to. End quote. Bush told the commission that he felt sure President Clinton had mentioned terrorism, but did not remember much being said about Al-Qaeda. Bush recalled that Clinton had emphasized other issues, such as North Korea and the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. In early January, Clark briefed Rice on terrorism. He gave similar presentations, 
prescribing al-Qaeda as both an adaptable global network of jihadist organizations and a lethal core terrorist organization, to Vice-President-elect Cheney, Hatley, and Secretary of State-designate Powell. One line in the briefing slides said that al-Qaeda had sleeper cells in more than 40 countries, including the United States. Berger told us that he made a point of dropping in on Clark's briefing of Rice to emphasize the importance of the issue. Later the same day, Berger met with Rice. He says that he told her the Bush administration would spend more time on terrorism in general, and al-Qaeda in particular, than on anything else. Rice's recollection was that Berger told her she would be surprised at how much more time she was going to spend on terrorism than she expected, but that the bulk of their conversation dealt with the faltering Middle East peace process and North Korea. Clark said that the new team, having been out of government for eight years, had a steep learning curve to understand al-Qaeda and the new transnational terrorist threat. Organizing a New Administration During the short transition, Rice and Hatley concentrated on staffing and organizing the NSC. Footnote Hatley told us that he was able to do less policy development than in a normal two-month transition. End footnote their policy priorities differed from those of the Clinton administration. Those priorities included China, missile defense, the collapse of the Middle East peace process, and the Persian Gulf. Footnote. Public references by candidate and then President Bush about terrorism before 9-11 tended to reflect these priorities, focusing on state-sponsored terrorism and WMD as a reason to mount a missile defense. See, for example, President Bush remarks, Warsaw University, June 15, 2001, and footnote. Generally aware that terrorism had changed since the first Bush administration, they paid particular attention to the question of how counterterrorism policy should be coordinated. Rice had asked University of Virginia history professor Philip Zelikoff to advise her on the transition. Footnote. Rice and Zelikoff had been colleagues on the NSC staff during the first Bush administration and were co-authors of a book concerning German unification. As the executive director of the commission, Zelikoff has recused himself from our work on the Clinton-Bush transition at the National Security Council. End footnote. Hatley and Zelikoff asked Clark and his deputy, Roger Cressy, for a special briefing on the terrorist threat and how Clark's Transnational Threats Directorate and Counterterrorism Security Group functioned. In the NSC, during the first Bush administration, many tough issues were addressed at the level of the deputies' committee. Issues did not go to the principals unless the deputies had been unable to resolve them. Presidential Decision Directive 62 of the Clinton administration had said specifically that Clark's Counterterrorism Security Group should report through the Deputies Committee, or, at Berger's discretion, directly to the principals. Berger had in practice allowed Clark's group to function as a parallel Deputies Committee, reporting directly to those members of the Principals Committee who sat on the special small group. There, Clark himself sat as a de facto principal. Rice decided to change the special structure that had been built to coordinate counterterrorism policy. It was important to sound policy-making, she felt, that Clark's interagency committee, like all others, report to the principals through the deputies. Rice made an initial decision to hold over both Clark and his entire counterterrorism staff, a decision that she called rare for a new administration. She decided also that Clark should retain the title of National Counterterrorism Coordinator, although he would no longer be a de facto member of the Principals' Committee on his issues. The decision to keep Clark, Rice said, was not uncontroversial, since he was known as someone who broke China. But she and Hatley wanted an experienced crisis manager. No one else from Berger's staff had Clark's detailed knowledge of the levers of government. Clark was disappointed at what he perceived as a demotion. He also worried that reporting through the Deputies' Committee would slow decision-making on counter-terrorism. Footnote. As Clark put it, quote, there goes our ability to get quick decisions. End quote. However, Paul Kurtz told the Commission that even though Clark complained about losing his seat on the Principals Committee on terrorism issues, Kurtz saw no functional change in Clark's status. End footnote. The result, amid all the changes accompanying the transition, was significant continuity in counter terrorism policy. Clark and his counterterrorism security group would continue to manage coordination. 
Tennant remained Director of Central Intelligence and kept the same chief subordinates, including Black and his chief at the counter-terrorist centre. Shelton remained Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, with the Joint Staff largely the same. At the FBI, Director Free and Assistant Director for Counter-Terrorism, Dill Watson, remained. Working-level counter-terrorism officials at the State Department and the Pentagon stayed on, as is typically the case. The changes were at the cabinet and sub-cabinet level, and in the CSG's reporting arrangements. At the sub-cabinet level, there were significant delays in the confirmation of key officials, particularly at the Defense Department. The procedures of the Bush administration were to be at once more formal and less formal than its predecessors. President Clinton, a voracious reader, received his daily intelligence briefings in writing. He often scrawled questions and comments in the margins, eliciting written responses. The new president, by contrast, reinstated the practice of face-to-face -face briefings from the DCI. President Bush and Tenet met in the Oval Office at 8 a.m., with Vice President Cheney, Rice and Card usually also present. The president and the DCI both told us that these daily sessions provided a useful opportunity for exchanges on intelligence issues. The president talked with Rice every day, and she in turn talked by phone at least daily with Powell and Rumsfeld. As a result, the President often felt less need for formal meetings. If, however, he decided that an event or an issue called for action, Rice would typically call on Hadley to have the Deputies Committee develop and review options. The President said that this process often tried his patience, but that he understood the necessity for coordination. Early Decisions Within the first few days after Bush's inauguration, Clark approached Rice in an effort to get her and the new president to give terrorism very high priority and to act on the agenda that he had pushed during the last few months of the previous administration. After Rice requested that all senior staff identify desirable major policy reviews or initiatives, Clark submitted an elaborate memorandum on January 25, 2001. He attached to it his 1998 Delenda Plan and the December 2000 Strategy Paper. We urgently need a principles-level review on the Al-Qaeda network, Clark wrote. He wanted the principles committee to decide whether Al-Qaeda was a first-order threat or a more modest worry being overblown by chicken-little alarmists. Alluding to the transition briefing that he had prepared for Rice, Clark wrote that Al-Qaeda, quote, is not some narrow little terrorist issue that needs to be included in broader regional policy, end quote. Two key decisions that had been deferred, he noted, concerned covert aid to keep the Northern Alliance alive when fighting began again in Afghanistan in the spring, and covert aid to the Uzbeks. Clark also suggested that decisions should be made soon on messages to the Taliban and Pakistan over the Al-Qaeda sanctuary in Afghanistan, on possible new money for CIA operations, and on when and how to respond to the attack on the USS Cole. The National Security Advisor did not respond directly to Clark's memorandum. No Principals Committee meeting on Al-Qaeda was held until September 4, 2001, although the Principals Committee met frequently on other subjects, such as the Middle East peace process, Russia, and the Persian Gulf. Footnote. The Bush administration held 32 Principals Committee meetings on subjects other than Al-Qaeda before 9-11. Rice told us the administration did not need a principal's meeting on Al-Qaeda because it knew that Al-Qaeda was a major threat. End footnote. But Rice and Hadley began to address the issues Clark had listed. What to do or say about the coal had been an obvious question since Inauguration Day. When the attack occurred, 25 days before the election, candidate Bush had said to CNN, quote, I hope that we can gather enough intelligence to figure out who did the act and take the necessary action. There must be a consequence. End quote. Footnote. Vice presidential candidate Dick Cheney also urged swift retaliation against those responsible for bombing the destroyer, saying, quote, Any would be terrorist out there needs to know that if you're going to attack, you'll be hit very hard and very quick. It's not time for diplomacy and debate, it's time for action. End quote. And footnote. Since the Clinton administration had not responded militarily, what was the Bush administration to do? On January 25th, Tenet briefed the President on the coal investigation. The written briefing repeated for top officials of the new administration what the CIA had told the Clinton White House in November. 
This included the preliminary judgment that Al-Qaeda was responsible, with the caveat that no evidence had yet been found that bin Laden himself ordered the attack. Tennant told us he had no recollection of a conversation with the President about this briefing. In his January 25th memo, Clark had advised Rice that the government should respond to the coal attack, but, quote, should take advantage of the policy that we will respond at a time, place, and manner of our own choosing, and not be forced into knee-jerk responses, end quote. Before Vice President Cheney visited the CIA in mid-February, Clark sent him a memo, outside the usual White House document management system, suggesting that he ask CIA officials, quote, what additional information is needed before CIA can definitively conclude that al-Qaeda was responsible, end quote, for the coal. In March 2001, the CIA's briefing slides for Rice were still describing the CIA's preliminary judgment that a strong circumstantial case could be made against al-Qaeda, but noting that the CIA continued to lack conclusive information on external command and control of the attack. Clark and his aides continued to provide Rice and Hatley with evidence reinforcing the case against al-Qaeda and urging action. Footnote. In early March, Cressy wrote Rice and Hatley that at a belated wedding reception at Tarnock Farms for one of bin Laden's sons, the al-Qaeda leader had read a new poem gloating about the attack on the coal. A few weeks later, Cressy wrote Hatley that while the law enforcement investigation went on, quote, we know all we need to about who did the attack to make a policy decision, end quote. Around this time, Clark wrote Rice and Hatley that the Yemeni Prime Minister had told State Department counterterrorism chief Hull that while Yemen was not saying so publicly, Yemen was 99% certain that bin Laden was responsible for the coal. In June, Clark wrote Rice and Hatley that a new Al-Qaeda video claimed responsibility for the coal. Later that month, two Saudi jihadists, arrested by Bahraini authorities during the threat spike, told their captors that their Al-Qaeda training camps in Afghanistan had held celebratory parties over the coal attack. End footnote. The President explained to us that he had been concerned lest an ineffectual airstrike just served to give bin Laden a propaganda advantage. He said he had not been told about Clinton administration warnings to the Taliban. The President told us that he had concluded that the United States must use ground forces for a job like this. Rice told us that there was never a formal, recorded decision not to retaliate specifically for the coal attack. Exchanges with the President, between the President and Tenet, and between herself and Powell and Rumsfeld, had produced a consensus that tit-for-tat responses were likely to be counterproductive. This had been the case, she thought, with the cruise missile strikes of August 1998. The new team at the Pentagon did not push for action. On the contrary, Rumsfeld thought that too much time had passed, and his deputy, Paul Wolfowitz, thought that the coal attack was stale. Hadley said that in the end, the administration's real response to the coal would be a new, more aggressive strategy against al-Qaeda. The administration decided to propose to Congress a substantial increase in counterterrorism funding for national security agencies, including the CIA and the FBI. This included a 27% increase in counterterrorism funding for the CIA. Starting a review In early March, the administration postponed action on proposals for increasing aid to the Northern Alliance and the Uzbeks. Rice noted at the time that a more wide-ranging examination of policy toward Afghanistan was needed first. She wanted the review very soon. Rice and others recalled the President saying, quote, I'm tired of swatting at flies. End quote. Footnote. Rice remembered President Bush using this phrase in May 2001, when warnings of terrorist threats began to multiply. However, speaking on background to the press in August 2002, Richard Clark described a directive from the President in March 2001 to stop swatting at flies and just solve this problem. A reporter then said to Clark that he understood Bush to have given that direction in May, and Clark said, no, it was March. End footnote. The President reportedly also said, quote, I'm tired of playing defense. I want to play offense. I want to take the fight to the terrorists. End quote. President Bush explained to us that he had become impatient. He apparently had heard proposals for rolling back al-Qaeda, but felt that catching terrorists one by one, or even cell by cell, was not an approach likely to succeed in the long run. 
At the same time, he said, he understood that policy had to be developed slowly so that diplomacy and financial and military measures could mesh with one another. Hadley convened an informal deputies committee meeting on March 7, when some of the deputies had not yet been confirmed. For the first time, Clark's various proposals, for aid to the Northern Alliance and the Uzbeks and for predator missions, went before the group that, in the Bush and a Sea, would do most of the policy work. Though they made no decisions on these specific proposals, Hadley apparently concluded that there should be a Presidential National Security Policy Directive, NSPD, on terrorism. Clark would later express irritation about the deputy's insistence that a strategy for coping with al-Qaeda be framed within the context of a regional policy. He doubted that the benefits would compensate for the time lost. The administration had in fact proceeded with principal's committee meetings on topics including Iraq and Sudan without prior contextual review, and Clark favoured moving ahead similarly with a narrow counter-terrorism agenda. But the President's senior advisers saw the Al-Qaeda problem as part of a puzzle that could not be assembled without filling in the pieces for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Rice deferred a principal's committee meeting on Al-Qaeda until the deputies had developed a new policy for their consideration. The full deputies' committee discussed Al-Qaeda on April 30th. CIA briefing slides describe Al-Qaeda as the most dangerous group we face, citing its leadership, experience, resources, safe haven in Afghanistan, and focus on attacking U.S. The slides warned, there will be more attacks. At the meeting, the deputies endorsed covert aid to Uzbekistan. Regarding the Northern Alliance, they, quote, agreed to make no major commitment at this time, end quote. Washington would first consider options for aiding other anti-Taliban groups. Meanwhile, the administration would, quote, initiate a comprehensive review of U.S. policy on Pakistan, end quote, and explore policy options on Afghanistan, quote, including the option of supporting regime change, end quote. Working-level officials were also to consider new steps on terrorist financing and America's perennially troubled public diplomacy efforts in the Muslim world, where NSC staff warned that, quote, we have by and large ceded the court of public opinion, end quote, to al-Qaeda. While Clark remained concerned about the pace of the policy review, he now saw a greater possibility of persuading the deputies to recognize the changed nature of terrorism. The process of fleshing out that strategy was underway. Louis Free, who had statutory tenure tenure, would remain director of the FBI until his voluntary retirement in the summer of 2001. Bush and his principal advisers had all received briefings on terrorism, including bin Laden. In early September 2000, acting deputy director of Central Intelligence John McLaughlin led a team to Bush's ranch in Crawford, Texas, and gave him a wide-ranging four-hour review of sensitive information. Staff, then Secretary of Transportation. For Secretary of State, Bush chose General Colin Powell, who had been National Security Advisor for President Ronald Reagan, and then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. For Secretary of Defense, he selected Donald Rumsfeld, a former member of Congress, White House Chief of Staff, and, under President Gerald Ford, already once Secretary of Defense. Bush decided fairly soon to keep Tenet as Director of Central Intelligence. Ford's 5-4 to four ruling on December 12th and Vice President Al Gore's concession, no one knew whether Gore or his Republican opponent, Texas Governor George W. Bush, would become president in 2001. The dispute over the election and a 36-day delay cut in half the normal transition period. Given that a presidential election in the United States brings wholesale change in personnel, this loss of time hampered the new administration in identifying, recruiting, clearing, and obtaining Senate confirmation of key appointees. From the old to the new. The principal figures on Bush's White House staff would be National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, who had been a member of the NSC staff in the administration of George H. W. Bush, Rice's deputy, Stephen Hatley, who had been an Assistant Secretary of Defense under the first Bush, and Chief of Staff Andrew Card, who had served that same administration as Deputy Chief of Staff. The 9-11 Commission Report, Chapter 6.4 Change and Continuity On November 7, 2000, American voters went to the polls in what turned out to be one of the closest presidential contests in U.S. history, an election campaign during which there was a notable absence of serious discussion of the al-Qaeda threat or terrorism, 
election night became a thirty-six-day legal fight. Until the Supreme Court